Hey guys, today's video lecture topic is going to be biotechnology, which is an ever-growing and ever-changing field of biology. So as you're watching today, please make sure you're answering questions on your video notes organizer, making sure to pause and rewatch things as many times as you need to in order to get those questions answered. So the field of biotechnology, it's important to just understand what that term means. Biotechnology means the manipulation of living organisms or using their components to produce useful commercial products. Like I said, this field is, is rapidly changing. It is rapidly growing. As our technology advances, we can do more things um, using either components of living organisms or using technologies to have an impact on living organisms. There are various uses of biotechnology in every field, everything from medicine, vaccines, um, pharmaceuticals, different gene therapy treatments, to agriculture, enhanced crops, enhanced feed, enhanced fertilizers. So take a second to pause here and write down a couple of uses of our various biotechnologies. Now here's the thing, even before we knew that DNA existed, we've understood how to manipulate DNA. In ancient times, people understood that they could breed cattle that were the biggest and the strongest, and then their offspring would be just as big and just as strong. Okay, this is called selective breeding, the process by which desired traits of certain plants or certain animals are selected and passed on to future generations. That is manipulating DNA. It's not manipulating DNA using the technology that we have today for genetic engineering, but we've understood that we can do this for a long time. There are different forms of selective breeding. Uh, first is hybridization, where you basically take parents that have different traits and you cross them in order to produce offspring with very specific traits. This is widely used by farmers, by animal breeders, by scientists, by gardeners, and they're typically selecting traits that are going to give the hybrid offspring some sort of competitive advantage. So like, for example, farmers are, t are taking their best tasting, sweetest, you know, fruits and they're crossing two varieties in order to produce a different fruit that has both traits that's going to sell better in the grocery stores. Okay, so disease resistant plants, um, uh, crossing organisms so that they produce more offspring, that they're faster growing, they're better looking, they're better tasting or whatever it is. But hybridization is parents with different traits. Okay, so for example, a mule is a result of selective breeding hybridization. We took horses, which are very big, they're very fast, they're very excitable, they have a lot of endurance, and we cross them with donkeys, which are slow and small and very calm. They have very calm demeanors. And we crossed them and we ended up with mules, which, are, which have traits of both, okay? They're very strong, they're very calm, they have a lot of endurance. So it's kind of like the best of both worlds. Now, sometimes that we know that that can come along with disadvantages that get passed along as well. Mules are infertile. They cannot produce offspring. Um, that's a result of hybridization. So to get a mule, you actually have to cross a horse and a donkey. You can't breed mules with each other. Okay, then the other type of selective breeding is inbreeding, which you've heard of before. Okay, this is where, you're you're, where you are crossing two very closely related organisms that have the desired traits already in order to ensure that all of the offspring have those traits in future generations. Purebreds, okay, purebred dogs, Clydesdales, for example, in this picture, those are all a result of inbreeding. But again, we know that that can come with consequences, right? We have these purebred dogs that have been inbred for so long, and with that breed comes skin problems or, you know, certain types of cancers or hearing problems or vision problems or things like that. Okay, so now we're going to get into the fun stuff, which is the actual use of biotechnology to manipulate DNA. So genetic engineering is when you have technology being used to alter, increase, or decrease specific genes in selected organisms. Okay, by 1970, we knew that there was DNA and that information flowed from DNA and then to RNA and then that produced proteins and proteins led to traits. But it wasn't until the 1980s and 1990s when technology started to improve where we were, where we were, where we were able to actually go in and manipulate the DNA of organisms. Um, this obviously has many applications all the way from from human health to agriculture, from medicine to farming. Now, it's important to understand that when I say genome, I'm talking about all of the DNA that is present in the nucleus of a cell, okay? So all of the chromosomes and the DNA inside of them. Genetic engineering to manipulate that DNA has to have 
tools to isolate certain genes from the rest of the genome. So it's important to talk about, okay, if we're trying to manipulate genes, how do we get those genes? There are some things that have to happen first, okay? We have to be able to extract DNA in order to, to be able to sequence it and do things with it. So the very first thing that has to happen is DNA has to be extracted, okay? So basically we take some cells and we lyse them. We basically pop them open so that all the DNA is freed from the cells. Then we wash all that components in order to sort of break down all the surrounding proteins and the salts that are surrounding the DNA. And then we filter all that stuff out the best that we can, but then we need to bring the DNA itself out of solution. So we add some isopropyl alcohol, which DNA does not blend with, and so the DNA sort of pops out of solution. So we can physically take the DNA out. Now we've got just the DNA by itself, and then we can store that in some sort of solution. It can be frozen for long periods of time until we're ready to actually do something with it. Okay. So now we're ready to do something with our DNA that we have extracted. The first thing you need to, be, to do in order to get a specific gene is you have to cut up that DNA. Okay, this is where restriction enzymes come in. Restriction enzymes are proteins, special types of proteins, those are enzymes, that recognize and bind to specific DNA sequences and cut the DNA within that sequence. So there are specific enzymes that recognize the CCTTA sequence, and when they see that, they bind to it and they cut the DNA at that location. These restriction enzymes are actually come from bacteria, which is a defense mechanism that bacteria have against viruses. So when a virus injects the DNA into the bacteria, the bacteria's restriction enzymes chop up the viral DNA so that it can't infect the bacteria. Okay, so the restriction enzymes, um, there are many different types. They attach to different types of sequences and each are responsible for isolating specific regions or genes of the genome. Now, some restriction enzymes, but not all of them, have what are called sticky ends, meaning that the two ends that are left uh, after the piece has been cut out um, are complementary to one another. And so they end up, just like Velcro, they end up ready to hook on to their opposite side. So you can see over here, we have this piece left after our restriction enzyme has cut out our target gene. And we have this piece left, left over here, and those are complementary sequences. So they end up sort of like Velcro hooking on to one another. Not all restriction enzymes have that, but a lot of them do. Okay, so now that we have sort of cut up our DNA molecule with our restriction enzymes and we have a bunch of smaller fragments, we can do some things with those fragments. We can sequence those individual genes so that we can study them, and we can insert those genes that have been cut into another organism in order to affect them in some way. But first, we have to separate those fragments from one another so that we can uh, isolate individual genes. This is when what's called gel electrophoresis comes into play. Gel electrophoresis uses an electrical current to separate a mixture of DNA fragments into their individual components based on their size. So here's how it works. You take a DNA sample, remember we've extracted DNA, we take and we've cut it up with restriction enzymes, and we load it into a gel, kind of like a flat rectangular piece of jello. We place a negative electrode at the end where the DNA is, and then we put a positive electrode at the other end, and we turn those on and that current starts to run. Because DNA has a negative charge, it moves towards the positive charge. It's attracted to that. Now, the gel is porous, so the fragments that are very small are able to move very quickly through the gel, but the larger fragments move slower and so they don't move as far. So you can see this graph here. Take a second to pause and draw the distance mi uh, migrated and the relationship between the size of the molecule. So what ends up happening is you can estimate the size of a fragment by how far it moves in the gel. This pattern of bands that you see here is called a restriction map of the original DNA. It shows the lengths of the DNA fragments between the restriction sites in a strand of DNA. So if they're real close up here, we can see that those sequences are about a thousand base pairs. That's what BP stands for. The ones that move so far and so fast, those are only about a hundred base pairs long. Okay, so this helps us separate those different fragments that we've cut using restriction enzymes. And then we can use that um, restriction map 
to make some conclusions, okay? So we know that your complete set of DNA is completely unique to you. So your DNA fingerprint, just like your fingerprint on your finger, is completely unique to you. It's a DNA fingerprint is a specific type of restriction map which can be used to identify a person at the molecular level. So a DNA fingerprint is just like your fingerprint on your finger because it identifies you as a unique individual just like your fingerprint does. Okay, so DNA samples are cut with restriction enzymes and your specific band pattern that is produced is used to identify you. And we can use this in forensic science to do things like identify, um, you know, suspects that from a crime scene or show relationships between individuals and more. So here's an example. We've gotten a DNA sample from a crime scene. Maybe there was some blood left there. We run a gel electrophoresis. We take DNA from our three suspects. We run their gels or their DNA in a gel electrophoresis and we compare them to the DNA found at the crime scene. Well, your bands are specific and unique to you. So we can see that suspect two's restriction map, their DNA fingerprint, matches the DNA that is found at the crime scene. Pause here and see if you can figure out who the father of this child is. Now remember, a child is a combination of the genes given by the mother and the father. So all of these sort of orangey peach genes here that the child has, you can see, were given by the mother. Can you figure out which father gave these more yellow colored genes? So pause here and circle who you think the father is. Okay, so now we're going to move on to um, a biotechnology called PCR. So we have scientists that need a large amount of DNA in order to study it in various ways, in order to manipulate it various ways, which means we need a lot of DNA. So how do we get a lot of DNA? Basically, they copy that same segment that they've now isolated over and over and over again using a tool called PCR, polymerase chain reaction. So PCR is a technique that produces millions or even billions of copies of a specific DNA sequence in a very short period of time. So how does it do that? Um, basically, PCR is like DNA replication taking place in a test tube. So instead of using an enzyme helicase, PCR separates the DNA using heat. Then the sample is cooled so that primers can attach to the separated DNA and polymerase, the enzyme, is added to the test tube and comes in and builds, just like it would in the nucleus, complementary strands of DNA. And then we use that heating and cooling process over and over and over again in order to um, continue to do that. So every time we have that heating and cooling cycle, the PCR doubles the amount of DNA. So in just 30 heating and cooling cycles, DNA has been copied more than 1 billion times, right? It's an exponential growth of DNA because it's doubling every time. So you can see how in just a couple cycles here, we go from this one strand of DNA, one fragment of DNA, to all of these fragments of DNA that have been copied over and over. Okay, now let's talk about recombinant DNA. Genetic engineering is based on, so being able to manipulate DNA is based on the use of recombinant DNA technology. Recombinant DNA is DNA that contains genes from more than one organism. And if an organism has recombinant DNA inside of it, meaning it has the DNA from another organism, we call those organisms transgenic organisms. So they have one or more genes from another organism in their genome. We use recombinant DNA in everything, okay? Farming, if you've had, ever heard of that, spelled with a PH, that's recombinant DNA that is used to create medicines. Um, we create crops that are resistant to frost. We create crops that are resistant to disease, crops that are resistant to pests, um, various types of animals that we use for research, right? We, we create these transgenic mice that are used for um, researching diabetes, for example. And anytime you hear the phrase GMO, that means genetically modified organism, that is a transgenic organism. So a lot of our corn that we sell here in the U.S. is GMO corn. It's corn who has had some sort of gene from another organism inserted into it to make it grow faster, to make it grow bigger, to make it resistant to pests or whatever it is. And this type of biotechnology, I'm sure you've heard of before, cloning. A clone is a genetically identical copy of a gene or organism. 
There are natural forms of cloning. Not all cloning is a result of genetic engineering. Natural cloning is like an identical twin. Okay, that's a clone. Uh, how, when plants asexually reproduce, though they are producing clones. When a starfish regenerates, that is technically cloning. When a, when a bacteria just divides through binary fission, that is technically cloning. So sometimes when you use cloning to... When you use genetic engineering to clone an organism, the cloned organisms don't look exactly like their original cloned counterpart. Why is that? These two clo these two cats are clones of one another. This is it's called CC carbon copy cat CC cat, and he does not look exactly like the cat that he was cloned from. We can draw some conclusions there, right? That many factors, including the environment, affect the expression of genes. There is a lot of potential in the world with cloning. If we could clone organs and be able to transplant those organs, that is huge, right? You're, you're giving someone an identical copy of their organ instead of having to depend on another individual. Being able to clone ind endangered species to ensure their survival. A lot of potential aspects of cloning. So how do we use genetic engineering to clone? In, I think it was 1996, Dolly the sheep was cloned. This was huge. It was the first major mam mammal to be cloned. How did they do that? Well, they took an egg from one sheep, this sheep right here, and they took the nucleus out of the egg. Now, remember in an egg, the nucleus is haploid. They took a somatic cell from another sheep. And remember, somatic cells are diploid. So they took the diploid nucleus out of that somatic cell and they popped it into the empty egg. So they fused them together. What that does is it basically tricks the egg into thinking that it's been fertilized because now it has a diploid nucleus inside of it. And so what that fertilized egg does is what any fertilized egg does is it starts to divide and then develop into an embryo. And once it divides enough, they implant that growing embryo into basically a surrogate mother sheep. And that produced Dolly the cloned lamb. Now my question to you is who is Dolly a clone of? Trace it back, circle who Dolly the lamb is genetically identical to. Remember her DNA is from who? Her clone. Circle who you think this, the clone sheep is. Um, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, there was a really popular project that was being researched called the Human Genome Project. The human genome has about 3 billion base pairs. That's a lot of base pairs. The Human Genome Project had two goals, to map and sequence all the DNA base pairs in human chromosomes, which we accomplished in 2003. And then goal number two was to identify every gene within the human genome. That's going to take a while, okay? Scientists continue to conduct research to determine the various roles of the many genes that we have. Genes are sequences. Ge genomes are compared. Proteins are analyzed. What happens to all of that huge amounts of data that we are producing regarding human genes? Um, the field of bioinformatics is using computer da databases to organize and analyze all of that biological data. This gives scientists a way to store, share, and find all of that genetic data, which can then be used for genetic screening, which is a process of testing DNA to determine a person's risk of having or passing on a genetic disorder. Sometimes genetic counselors do genetic screening where they're just looking at a pedigree and analyzing traits that way, um, or they are running specific DNA tests in order to help the consumers make informed decisions, right? We're looking for specific genes or proteins that indicate the um, increased likelihood of a certain disorder. Like you've probably heard of the BRAC gene before. We know that that's been linked to breast cancer. So genetic screen can indicate whether the person has an increased risk if they have a mutation in the BRAC gene and that person can make informed decisions about what to do in the future. And then we also have genetic, screen that genetic screening that allows us to be able to perform gene therapies where we can actually replace defective or missing genes or we can add in new genes into a person's genome to treat a disease. The first successful gene therapy was in 1990 to fix essentially a, a genetic autoimmune disease in a pair of children and they were able to grow up and live totally normal healthy lives. This is a very controversial but a very um, growing and changing field and I'm sure that you can imagine, imagine why. The potential to save lives is very great but a lot of gene therapy is still very experimental so there's a lot of research still being done there on what how far we can go with gene therapy. Here's the thing, 
all the things that we've talked about, all these different forms of genetic engineering, they alter the natural genetic makeup of an organism. As you can imagine, that is very controversial. So as we are going forward in this unit, I want you to consider some things. Do I, do you, consider genetic engineering ethical, altering the natural genetic makeup of an organism? If I, if I am okay with that, how, what am I okay with? How far is too far? And you need to think about where do you draw your line? Eventually, you're going to grow up. You're going to be a consumer. You're going to be in charge of, you know, buying your own groceries. Are you okay with buying genetically modified foods? Are you not okay? So as we talk about these different controversial topics, I want you to be reflecting on where is my line? So hope this topic was interesting to you. Uh, make sure you go back and rewatch anything you need to. Have a good day.